Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Richard Martin, one of the product management team from Electrorent, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. The subject for this session is drive testing, focusing on how to test live 5G networks. Let me introduce today's speaker, Peter Vungi, who works for InfoVista as a technical sales manager. With nearly 18 years of experience on the Thames product portfolio, I'm certain his insights in this emerging topic will be invaluable to us all. Should you have any questions during this session, please feel free to put them into the questions box on the GoToMeeting session, and we will look forward to answering them at the end of the webinar during our Q&A section. With the formalities out of the way, I'll hand over to Peter so he can take you through this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, as Richard said, my name is Peter Vungi and I'm working as a technical sales manager at InfoVista. InfoVista offers, among many products and solutions, a Thames portfolio, which is a complete set of solutions for, for drive testing, benchmarking, monitoring and analysis of mobile networks. I have been invited by Electroren to talk about drive testing of wireless networks and specifically 5G NR. There might be a few of you that are very skilled in the era, but I assume we also have a few people in the audience with less knowledge about drive testing and 5G. I will therefore start with a short introduction before moving on to 5G NR uh, related measurements and measurement activities. In the end, I will also give you a brief summary of different types of drive test tools that can be used. The basic idea is that you need knowledge of performance in order to improve. You want to quantify the performance and the enabler is measurements. A racing car needs to be tuned for maximum speed and traction. A number of measurement probes provides the engineers with the information needed in order to tune engine settings, to adjust chassis or suspension, to choose the right set of tires, etc. Measurement probes will also give the driver the information required to take the correct decisions at the right time on the track in order to maximize performance. From a measurement concept point of view, there aren't much that differs a radio access network from a racing car. The goal is maximum performance. In order to improve the performance in a radio access network, several tools and monitoring systems are used. Drive test and post-processing tools, protocol analyzers, OSS features including node statistics, events, recordings, etc. But maybe the most important probe is the customer. As a difference to core network probes or node, stati node statistics and event counter information from the ONM system, dry test tools give the user the ability to collect exact geographical position measurements from a user's perspective. We will experience the network as all other subscribers do and we are using the services in the same way as all other users. What you would like to measure and record with a drive testing tool can vary depending on the use case. But in general, you're interested in traditional RF data, layer two, layer three messages, IP information, application layer information. In short, you want to collect the information that allows you to quantify your coverage and service performance, and the related data that allows you to troubleshoot possible problems. NR in 5G NR stands for new radio, and as all new things, it comes with opportunities as well as with challenges. 5G was designed by 3GPP to be the global standard for the air interface of 5G networks. It uses an OFDM air interface and can utilize a wide range of frequencies, including the millimeter wave frequency spectrum. 
higher frequencies enable more bandwidth and with that we get higher data rates. WFDM is a digital multi-carrier modulation method in which a large number of closely separated orthogonal subcarriers are used to carry data on several parallel streams. It means that the information is transmitted across multi multiple parallel narrow bands instead of a single wideband. This is also a modulation technique that was used in the downlink for, for LTE. 5G enables a new kind of network that is designed to connect virtually everyone and everything together, including machines, objects and devices. In some articles I've seen that it's stated that 5G is not really another G, but rather an ecosystem of technologies, services and verticals. The goal is to provide a seamless user experience, regardless if humans or machines are the users. 5G networks will support three main use cases. Enhanced mobile broadband, massive machine communication, and ultra-reliable low-latency communication. Each one of these has different peak data rates, latency, mobility, and reliability requirements. EMBB will mainly be about data capacity and speed. MMTC will focus on cost efficiency and massive connectivity. And for URLLC, low latency, reliability, and security will be important. And if you have important requirements, it might be of interest to quantify those from a user's perspective. Consequently, 5G networks will change the game, pushing the boundaries for throughput, latency, and flexibility enabling an evolution of new verticals. 5G should provide connectivity to anything from entertainment to smart cities, asset tracking to Industry 4.0 and gaming. Today it's enhanced mobile broadband that is targeted with the first 5G network rollouts, even if we in most places haven't entered the millimeter wave spectrum. But with deploying a new technology, there will also be challenges. We have a new rather scalable OFDM based radio interface with a flexible slot based structure. That is something we have to understand and take into consideration when deploying our network. As mentioned, 5G is a very flexible uh, technology in regards of frequency spectrum in some cases, we will operate in frequencies that we haven't used with our legacy technologies. What challenges will the new network, uh, this new spectrum bring us? That is something that must be considered in uh, propagation models when planning the network. The new beam concept is also something we must consider when planning and deploying our network. A cell is still a cell, but in a specific cell, we will have multiple beams that can serve the user. Today, most 5G or deployments in the region are non-standalone. In short, it means that 5G operation is directly dependent of the underlying 4G network. It uses the 4G core network for the control plane, and now we have two networks technologies that must be considered. Without 4G coverage, no 5G. On, to on top of that, uh, we must think about how we should validate the performance of our network. What kind of testing, methodology and processes are required to verify a site or to do acceptance on a 5G network? All these bullets have to be reflected when creating guidelines for planning, deployment and optimization. We will talk more about these different areas in the coming slides. As you understand, it's not possible to cover everything related to 5G measurements and use cases and tools in 45 minutes to an hour. My goal is to give you a basic idea of what we are measuring and some examples of initial test cases that are performed. 
For a UE to communicate with a 5G NR network, it needs to get necessary system information in order to find and synchronize with a specific cell. This is called cell search and it's facilitated by the network via transmission of synchronization and signal blocks. This information is also central for mobility activities such as handover and cell reselection. The synchronization and signal blocks are transmitted periodically inside the 5G NR channel. The SSB consists of the primary synchronization signal, the secondary synchronization signal and the primary broadcast channel. If we have something that is periodically transmitted that can be located, then we have something to measure on both with a UE and a scanner. The location of the SSB is defined by the Global Synchronization Channel Number, GSCN. And in the case of scanner measurements, this is something we must dis define together with the subcarrier spacing in order to allow the scanner to listen to the right place. Based on the transmitted synchronization and signal blocks, we now have the possibility to see, for example, the physical cell ID for a specific cell. Uh, as well as RSSI, RSRP, RSRQ and CNR values for the cell beams. I touched on this earlier uh, and I will not go into details, but I would like to mention that what you would like to measure or verify is also dependent uh, on the 5G use cases and its key enablers. Each use case has its different requirements, what is important, and with that different demands on what to measure and verify. Coverage is always essential for connectivity, but from a service performance point of view, there will be differences depending on the use cases. For EMBB, high peak rates will be in focus for optimization, while a very low latency is prioritized for URL-LC. Uh, let's leave this and continue with some initial test scenarios currently performed. As stated earlier, 5G NR is specified to operate in a very wide spectrum and with variable bandwidth. And with that comes some challenges. Depending on the 5G use case, various spectrum and bandwidths are by default preferred and that is illustrated in the picture. Even if we see some millimeter wave deployments already, the majority of the 5G networks in our region are rolled out on existing frequency band or on the 3.5 gigahertz band. If the 3.5 gigahertz band hasn't been handed out to operators by the regulator, there are still ways forward. Some operators have performed spectrum reforming to enable a 5G deployment on a band previously used for a legacy technology. Band 28, 700 megahertz, is one example of a band used for 5G in some places today. On 700 megahertz, you don't have much bandwidth, and that will, of course, result in a low throughput. But the lower bands are very favorable from a coverage point of view. If you roll out 5G on a low band for coverage reasons, you would like to use LT anchor band uh, with similar coverage. Today, this low band, low band configuration is challenging due to UE capability limitations. Other operators are dynamically sharing uh, a specific band uh, between 5G and LT allowing users on both technologies on the same band at the same time. Both spectrum reforming and DSS are good ways to get started and get a quick footprint with 5G. In both cases, we are dealing with frequencies known by the operators. Most of today's 5G networks are deployed in the 3.5 gigahertz band, and that is a new spectrum for many of the operators. The higher we go in frequency, the more bandwidth we get to play with, 
and that is of course great from a throughput and capacity point of view. The price we must pay is increased propagation loss and higher vulnerability to blockage with a decreased coverage area as the result. When planning a radio access network, planning tools are used. They use propagation models to assess the coverage. In order to get as close to reality as possible, these propagation models must be tuned. A new spectrum like the 3.5 gigahertz band will trigger drive test activities to collect data used for propagation model tuning. Preferably, the measurements are performed with the scanner using an omnidirectional antenna placed on the roof of the car. So drive test data is not only feeding post-processing and analysis tools, but it's also a direct input to the planning tools. It is important that the interface between the tools are in place to simplify the propagation model tuning. Another early drive test activity related to new spectrum is spectrum clearing. A frequency band that you have been awarded might previously been used for broadcasting, military communication or by other companies using other technologies. The purpose with activity is to make sure that no one else is transmitting in the spectrum. In short, you would like to identify possible interferers as early as possible in order to minimize future problems. The activity is performed with the scanner detecting received power over the frequency band of interest. In the picture, you can see received power in relation to frequency at an instance in time for band 78, 3.5 GHz, and band 40. As uh, previously mentioned, a cell is still a cell, but in a specific cell, we will have multiple beams that can serve the user. The periodically transmitted synchronization and signal blocks on the different beams allow us to identify and measure beams. A SSB index is used to separate SSB transmission on different beams. During a drive test, we pass several PCIs, cells, and several SSB indexes, beams, belonging to these PCIs and specific, uh, a specific beam is then described by a combination of the PCI and the SSB index. The number of beams that are used per cell is frequency as well as network and vendor dependent. In 3.5 gigahertz, eight beams can be used per cell, but when we move into millimeter waves, 64 beams, 64 beams can be used. We have also seen that the capability to switch between beams in a cell is device dependent. It should also be mentioned that what you're able to measure on a serving beam and detected beams differs between devices and chipsets. A drive test tool with a scanner or a UE can be used to detect the presence of the different beams in a cell. But a UE is of course required to attach to a serving beam and to verify that the network is operational. Due to the, in some cases, uh, fast switching between beams in urban environments, analysis is preferably performed in a post-processing post tool if required. Here is one example of a 5G signal scan measurement that has been visualized with Thames investigation. On the right hand side, we can see a window presenting the status at one instance in time. The cells uh, that the scanner has detected, in this case, cell identity 47, 241, 242, etc. We can also see the beam, beams detected for each cell and they are presented with their beam index. And for each detected cell and beam combination, we get our RF information. On the left-hand side, we're viewing the strongest scan cell beam combination, the second strongest cell beam combination, etc. over time. The right information elements, sorting capabilities, and predefined presentation windows allows the user to get a quick 
and good view of the situation. Here's yet another example on visualization of the different beams from a drive test. This example is definitely not taken in an urban environment since we can see beams being dominant over time. In the line chart, we are plotting SSS RP for all detected beams for one specific cell. We can see that beam index 2 is strongest the first 15 seconds, replaced by beam index 3 for the coming 5 seconds, and so on. In the eight maps below, we can see where the different beams have been detected by the scanner. So a scanner is a very good measurement probe for validation of 5G cell and beam coverage. It gives us a quick view of everything that is out there. And with a professional post-processing tool, you'll be able to turn the scanning data into useful information that can be used to take the correct decisions. It should also be mentioned that you with a scanner can measure multiple technologies and bands at the same time. In a non-standalone 5G deployment, it is of course also of interest to have a good picture of the underlying LT network. A UE measures from a user's perspective and will experience the network as all other users. Beams are also detected and measured by UEs. What you will get is dependent uh, on the, the UE chipset. Certain chipset gives you more information than other. In the map, we can see the serving SSB, RSRP and RSRQ, the serving cell identity, as well as the serving SSB beam index. If we look at one cell PCI in the map, we can see that we are switching between serving beams quite a lot. To get a better view of how frequent we change beam, the serving SSB beam index has been plotted in the lower line chart. The high switch rate, multiple changes per second, is the result of multiple equally strong beams that can be used. I assume that this is how it often will look in an urban environment. A scanner can give us information about strongest cells and beams, but the UE is required to understand what beams that are serving the user and how frequent we will switch between beams. A scanner measures all present cell beams, while a UE will measure only what it's told to by the network. UEs are important measurement probes, not only for service performance validation, but also for fundamental network testing and troubleshooting. It will allow you to verify that you can access and use the 5G or network. We have seen in some cases where everything looks perfect from a scanner or a coverage point of view, but when we connect the UE, nothing works. You can simply not attach to the 5G network. And the reason is often configuration issues in the network, logical links missing, etc. The shift from cell to beam centric network will result in several new beam related information elements, parameters. Beam coverage analysis can be performed as seen on the previous slides with both scanners and UEs. Another aspect is that frequent beam reports, a large number of beams will make our log files larger. And with that comes a demand for intelligent sampling and data reduction in conjunction with analysis. In some places, we've also seen an interest in drone testing as a result of antenna and beam deployments. These measurements are performed with a drone carrying one Thames pocket device. The goal is to get a vertical view of the cell beam coverage. Drones can also be used to verify sites that are tricky to access with the car. For previous 
technology deployments, operators have validated the operation and performance of the new network, as well as the interaction with legacy networks. For 5G NR non-standalone deployments, 5G operation is directly dependent of the underlying 4G network. We have dual connectivity scenario, where control signaling is pushed through the LT in or base to the evolved packet core, and user data is split between LT and 5G NR. We have a multi-RAT connectivity situation that we must consider when validating operation and performance. Coverage for both technologies, as well as the contributing parts in regards to performance, are of interest. Mobility validation now includes both handovers for LT, control and data, and 5G NR data. From a drive test tool perspective, it's important that both LT and 5G data can, can be recorded and that we are able to view LT and 5G information as well as common, common signaling at the same time. In the picture, you can see a multi-technology workspace in terms of investigation, allowing the user to, to view the LT parts, then our information elements and the common signaling at the same time. As a user, you want to be able to see directly when you are in a multi-RAT connectivity mode and when you are in LT-only coverage. You should be able to analyze the overall coverage and performance as well as the contributing individual parts. All necessary information used for troubleshooting and optimization must be recorded during the drive test. The picture shows data collected with one Temps Pocket handset running a continuous HTTP file download. On the maps, we can see our 5G NR coverage and our LT coverage plotted as single strength. And in the line chart, we can see the throughput we can achieve by with the UE. Uh, the green line shows the total physical throughput, while the blue and purple lines uh, present the physical throughput for the contributing 5G NR and LT parts. The LT parts can also be visualized per carrier in case of carrier aggregation. For legacy technologies, it has always been preferred uh, to perform a service test on device, but for 5G NR it's a must. On-device measurements means that you are using clients located on the device instead of on the laptop to perform your services. Using tethering and a client on the laptop will limit the shift throughput and thereby not be represent representative as network performance. To evaluate the performance, in this case throughput, you must look at the contributing parts. What do I get from 5G? what do I get from my different LT carriers. To troubleshoot, you can look into the details, such as CQI, rank and modulation, how many PDCH layers do I get, and which modulation schemes are used. For 5G, it's also of interest to analyze the bandwidth part. Even if your 5G network is using 100 megahertz, you don't know if everything has been assigned to you. The bandwidth part ID will tell you how much bandwidth that has been assigned to you and thereby give you a possible explanation for your low throughput. The FTP download with the throughput measurements is only one of many services that should be tested from an accessibility, retainability and integrity point of view. Don't forget to test the uplink. Uh, I also recently heard that the latest firmwares in the devices now also supports split uplink and with that higher uplink speeds. The interest in high uplink rates will increase going forward with new verticals. Initial drive testing is mainly about coverage and operation. Are the new site operational and if not, why? 
where can I access and use my 5G network? Uh, but drive testing uh, is initially also about learning a new technology. I also would like to say a few words around the alternative 5G configurations before we go into the drive testing tools. Dynamically spectrum, uh, dynamic spectrum sharing, DSS, allows operators to dynamically switch between LT and 5G NR transmission on existing LT band. LT and 5G NR share the same resource blocks in a dynamical manner. The upside is a quick rollout of 5G NR. The downside can be that if you activate DSS and you have no 5G users in the network, you will lose a bit of your uh, LT capacity. TEMS tools can also be used to measure and analyze DSS functionality and performance. To measure DSS, you have to make sure that you have a device supporting your DSS network. Perform your measurements with, for example, TEMS Pocket or TEMS Investigation as you are used to. If you want to verify that you really can be connected to the same band on a site with LT and 5G NOR, you can connect two devices to TEMS Investigation, one attached to LT only and one attached to 5G. Uh, use information elements and messages to verify DSS operation. Here we have one example of two devices sharing the same spectrum. It can also be mentioned that your legacy scanner will encounter issues measuring LT on a specific LT band if DSS has been activated on that band. You will simply not be able to continue to scan your LT bands as you have done in the past. Uh, the scanner will be confused due to the new uh, presence of, of 5G, 5G frames. This has been solved by the scanner vendors and the scanners will need uh, a firmware upgrade or maybe a new license options to get back on track. Uh, 5GNR is also available in a standalone configuration. And we, here we have removed the control plane from LT and are utilizing an own 5G core. I will not talk more about this. And the main reason for that is that I personally not have seen any SA configurations outside the labs. But even if I haven't seen it, they do exist. There are networks and devices available in other parts of the world. TEMS tools are in place to verify and analyze 5G standalone configuration and they are used by, by, by customers to, to validate operation uh, and uh, verify performance. Standalone will not utilize LT in the same way as non-standalone configuration but now inter-system handover, EPS fallback etc have to be considered during verification of the network. If we should drive test a 5G network, we need some type of tool as well as some measurement probes. 5G is, as, I've been, as I have presented, introducing some new challenges, but the drive test tool should not be one of those. Yes, you have to learn and understand 5G NOR as a technology. Yes, you have to adapt to new methods and activities but you don't have to learn to handle a new drive test tool. TEMS Pocket or TEMS Investigation can be used in the same way as used for legacy technologies. On the coming slides, I will give you a short summary of some TEMS tools used for drive testing and analysis. Drive testing plays or still plays an important role in several activities that are performed during the life cycle of a network. From site verification, where measurements are performed in order to identify problems introduced during site installation and to validate equipment functionality, through the labor-intensive tuning and optimization phase, to the monitoring activities where you want to locate and eliminate problems as early as possible, 
not to affect customers. All these activities are performed for our legacy RON technologies and are also valid for 5G NR. What type of tool to use is often a result of work, process, work processes, uh, preferences, even though some tools can be more suitable than others for certain activities and use cases. A good starting point when choosing what type of tool to use is the use case. Are the measurements related to, to site verification, service monitoring or, or a benchmarking activity? Will the measurement be performed outdoor or indoor, mobile or stationary? It can also be smart to look at the reporting requirements before choosing the tool. How do you want to perform the measurements? who should do it and how often should they be performed. A handheld solution is of course more convenient if you will perform indoor measurements and must carry your equipment, while a fully autonomous solution is better if 24-7 measurements should be conducted. If the person performing the drive testing uh, is an engineer that would like to do analysis on the fly, uh, or is it just a driver that wants to collect data via simple user interface? To summarize, it can be said that most type of tools can be used in most, most of the mentioned scenarios, but one tool can be more suitable than another for a certain situation or activity. Money is also a strong driver, and many service companies have a slightly different approach since projects in some cases are short and margins are of essence. Uh, if they purchase a tool, then they often prefer a flexible tool that can be used in many different projects, or they want to rent the tools they need for the project, and here ElectroRent can offer their services. When you have uh, set what type of tool to use, it often comes down to the measurement probes. What smartphones should I use? Does it support all the technologies, features of interest, etc., for a specific network? Do I require, require a scanner to perform my tasks? We'll talk a little bit more about 5G devices and scanners later. Premise investigation is Informista's most versatile network testing solution. Since introduced almost 30 years ago, it has been the leading drive test solution on the market. It offers one solution to collect, analyze data used for monitoring, troubleshooting and optimization of our networks. It consists of a laptop running Thames investigation software to which you connect your different measurement probes. It provides the user with a simple and efficient data collection capabilities. It has multi-device, multi-vendor support, enabling measurements with hundreds of different measurement probes. Service quality testing is performed from a user's perspective and can be automated via scripts. Any of the thousands of available information elements and KPIs can be viewed in real time or replayed afterwards for analysis reasons. The information can be presented in any type of presentation window in any way preferred by the user. Hence, investigation also supports a wide range of, of use cases. For the last two years, Thames Investigation has been used and are used to measure and analyze 5G NR operation. Uh, it supports most of the 5G NR devices and chipsets, including devices based on Qualcomm, Samsung, and Huawei high silicon chipsets. PCTEL, IBFlex, MXFlex, HBFlex, and Roland Schwarz TSME6 5G capable scanners can be connected. 5G NR uh, related workspaces are available. You have your information elements, event messages, everything in place in order to do your drive testing and analysis in exactly the way that you are used to. Uh, all these workspaces, information elements, etc., will also evolve over time with new features and new device specifications. Thames Investigation supports a huge number of 5G and NOR capable devices. These devices can be divided in, in three different categories. 
a connectable device is a standard commercial handset that has been implemented in Thames investigation. In order to be auto-detected and used in Thames investigation, you must be able to activate the diagnostics on the connectable device. With diagnostics enabled, Thames investigation will be able to communicate with the device and get the reports required. Thames devices are devices devices offered as a part of the Thames portfolio. De these devices have additional functionality and have diagnostics enabled when delivered. Unknown devices are devices that haven't been implemented by InfoVista and therefore won't be auto-detected by default. If an unknown device is using a supported chipset and diagnostics ports are available, you can manually detect the device and use it with Thames investigation. As you can see on the slide, most of the 5G uh, capable devices available on the market are supported and can be used. That a device supports 5G is not a guarantee that it will work on your 5G network. In many cases, the specific 5G network has to be enabled in the firmware of the device to allow 5G operation. Always make sure that the device of interest is enabling your specific 5G network before choosing a device. And as I mentioned earlier, on-device measurements are important for 5G and NOR. Thames investigation also supports scanners and scanner measurements. From PCTEL, the small and handy IB Flex scanner, the powerful MX Flex, and the millimeter wave capable HP Flex scanners can be used. And from Roden Swartz, it's the TSME 6 that can be connected. The TSME 6 supports the sub 6, sub, sub 6 gigahertz spectrum, but can be extended to millimeter waves via the DC30 optional hardware. If you're performing indoor measurements or need to carry your equipment for other reasons, a portable network testing solution is preferred. InfoVista's handle solution is called Thames Pocket. Thames Pocket turns your, your normal phone into a powerful and advanced test tool. It allows the user to measure network quality and service performance, both indoor and outdoor, and collect the same type of information as collected with, for example, Thames investigation. It's very easy to learn and operate, and considering that most of the mobile voice and data traffic is generated in indoor environments, Thames Pocket is a solution that is preferred by many. The real-time data visualization capabilities in Thames Pocket allows users to monitor and verify network and service performance on the fly. This functionality makes it the perfect choice for troubleshooting and site verification activities. The built-in event functionality can also help you to locate and identify problems without even looking for them. More and more customers are using Thames Pocket devices to collect data for later analysis, drive testing. Service testing is performed based on scripts, specifying the actions required, including control functions. Measurements are positioned with the GPS if you're outdoor, or manually via pinpointing if you're indoor. And log files can automatically be uploaded to an FTP server for further analysis and reporting. 5G measurements is also supported by Thames Pocket. And 5G NR information is presented in the different data views available. From a device point of view, less 5G capable devices are supported compared to Thames investigation but you have several Qualcomm and Samsung chipset-based devices from the major vendors to choose from. Thames Pocket can also utilize PCTEL, IB Flex and HB Flex scanners to perform 5G scanning. If you want to perform continuous testing over time, an unintended network testing solution might be preferred. These type of solutions are remotely controlled and allows you to decide what to test as well as to, to analyze the collected information without leaving your office. 
and sense is InfoVista's unattended solution designed for robustness, reliability and automation, providing a ground for, for 24-7 uh, network testing. Probes installed in company vehicles, buses, trains, ferries or on stationary locations such as airport, train stations, shopping malls or in VIP customer offices are managed and controlled remotely via a web interface. Service performance can be visualized and analyzed in real time and log file information can be used for automatic report generation or presented in different dashboards. The measurement probe is built on a smartphone so, for all other, so as for all other tools you are measuring it from a user's perspective. ChemSense is also suitable for test activities that must be performed continuously over time like for example quality of service monitoring. Uh, the different drive test tools I have been presenting collect data and would like to turn this data into useful information that can be done uh, in, in real time or during replay directly on the screen of the handset in Temps Pocket or on the laptop in case of Temps investigation. But if you want to analyze multiple log files, have access to more advanced analysis features or to create reports, a dedicated analysis and reporting tool is preferred. In the TEMS portfolio, TENS Discovery is used for advanced post-processing and reporting. It is a tool designed for the purpose and it gives the user the possibility to manage large volumes of collected drive test data and turn it into valuable information in a simple and automated manner. Because in the end, the purpose with the drive testing is to provide information on which we can improve our radio access network. To summarize, I would like to say that uh, knowledge or performance is necessary in order to improve, that drive testing still plays an important role in several activities that should be performed during the life cycle of a network, that with 5G or there are some new things that we have to consider, the new spectrum, the beam concept and massive MIMO deployments, and with the non-standalone deployments that we have today, drive test must be done uh, both on LTE and 5G. The TEMS portfolio supports drive testing of 5G NR, including NSA, DSS and SA configurations. Think about what type of tool to use, what is best for you and your activities. Think about what device to use and here the starting point should always be that it's working in your specific 5G network and think also about using ODM measurements. That was all from my side. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in during the uh, webinar, so I'll just uh, start with those. Uh, first one, um, during the testing um, slides you were showing on one UE, it showed that it was latched to a 5G NR. But when you looked on the side, the NR value is shown as zero. Is that therefore latched to a 5G network or not? Or should there be a value in that NR value? Uh, there I don't follow uh, the question. Was that one of the slides? Yes, yes, I believe so. It came up uh, just after one of the slides. Uh, then we have to look into that specific slide for, for me to understand what, what the question is about. Um, Maybe we can come back with that. Absolutely, I, I will send that through and we can get an answer to the uh, person who answered it. Uh, uh, in the different drive testing tool, you can see directly uh, what kind of uh, technology you are working on. If, if you are uh, drive testing or if you are attached to 5G NR, you will see that you are on uh, NR ENDC, uh, or if it's LT only, or if it is uh, one or two or three carriers on LT together with 5G. So that type of information will be directly presented to you. 
Okay, wonderful. Uh, you mentioned obviously drones being used with uh, individual Thames Pocket devices. If you were looking to do testing of coverage with multiple uh, on multiple signals and multiple um, networks, would it be possible, assuming the drone could carry the weight, to use multiple phones, or could you even use a scanner in that particular instance to test for coverage of multiple um, networks? Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure that there are drones today uh, that can carry an uh, IBFlex battery-driven scanner together with a Thames Pocket, so that is not a problem. Uh, if you want to use multiple phones, yes, there are uh, possible ways to connect pockets together, but then, of course, it will also be a matter of, of the weight and, and how much the drone can carry. But uh, a small IBFlex scanner with battery and a phone, I'm pretty sure that there are drones uh, capable of lifting that kind of weight today. And this would say the, the measurements that you should do with the scanner, that is something that you start from pocket before you take off. So, so that will not be a problem. Yeah, another question has come in. Is it possible to run drive test measurements on a network simulator within a lab situation? Ah, uh, that I don't know. Uh, in order to, uh, to measure anything, uh, you need to have a signal sent out that can be received by the UE or by the scanner. Uh, there are software kind of based networks uh, in, in labs, but if they transmit something, yeah, then you can use UEs or, or, or scanners to measure it. But there has and to be obviously. some kind of trans transmission in, in the air, of course, to receive it. Yes, yeah. Um, on another note, on a similar question, could a Thames Pocket be used for UE testing? Yes, a Thames Pocket is a UE, uh, so that is more or less the, the definition of UE testing. So a UE means user equipment, that is a phone, a smartphone or some other piece of user equipment uh, that is used by us, the users, and Thames Pocket is a software put directly onto the handset, onto the smartphone, so that is a typical UE uh, tool measurement. Fantastic. Um, on millimeter wave, are, we, are you expecting to see in the market uh, millimeter wave devices in the future for personal use, or are you expecting millimeter wave more to be used for machine communication? Uh, the majority of, uh, let's say, the use case that has been described uh, for millimeter way is uh, fixed wireless access uh, foremost. But uh, as I understand, there are normal UEs today uh, capable of this already. It's not just in, in my area. I haven't seen it. I work mainly in the northern parts of, of Europe, and here we don't have that much uh, millimeter wave outside the, the lab environments so far. Okay, well that's come to the end of our question, so I'd just like to say, oh no, hang on, just literally, one's just literally dropped into there. Um, uh, or two actually. Is it possible to transfer um, Thames Pocket software from one UE to another? So from moving it from a device you already, um, perhaps an older device you own to a newer device? Yes, uh, everything is software based. Uh, licenses are, are located in the cloud. So if you have one Thames Pocket license and you pay kind of support for that or can upgrade it to the latest, you can always reuse that and move it to, to newer devices. What you have to think of is that Thames Pocket uh, software and a license cannot be put on a commercial phone. So you cannot go to a store and buy a phone on which you can put Thames Pocket on. It has to ha have access to the chipset inside the phone. So in these cases, we are talking about Thames phones that has to be used uh, in order for Thames Pocket, Thames Pocket to work. Um, same, kind, same kind of phones, no difference, but they are open for us to access the, the chipsets. Okay. Um, with um, scanning, when you're using a scanner application, um, is there any kind of formulae or so forth you can use to work out the maximum speed you can travel at? With that sort of testing, I know there are, in the past there's been limits to how fast scanning can work, but I was wondering if there's any kind of rough formula you would use in that sort of testing. Uh, that is tricky for me to answer. Uh, the scanning vendors have better knowledge about this, but exactly as uh, the question states, 
that is something that you have to take into consideration. Uh, if you look at, for example, a piece of tel MX Flex scanners, where you can have four, uh, what's say, scanning task doing performed at exactly the same time, and then you put everything in in a sequence after that, you can you can do a lot, and and with that you can also drive faster. If you take a scanner only having kind of one radio path through and you have to put everything in sequence, then of course there is a limit. When do I get to too far distance in time or kilometers or meters between two measuring points? So it is a valid question. It's something that should be thought of when choosing a scanner. So, for example, if you have to scan a lot of things at the same time and you need uh, rather frequent measurement points, you should go for one of the more powerful scanners, for example, the, the MX Flex scanner from PCTEL. And we've had another one. Uh, there's a uh, person on the set, uh, webinar at the moment who's a UE developer. Could Thames Pocket, for example, be integrated onto one of their products if it was using a known chipset? That is absolutely possible. Okay, so at that point, obviously, there would be a discussion. I assume they would have to provide a device. Yeah, that, that would be a discussion between that company and product management at InfoVista. And then we will see what, what that will lead to. Okay, wonderful. I will pass on contact details at the end of this, obviously. And as someone has also asked, if they are in a 5G area or an area with a 5G signal, why would their UE move from 5G to 4G? Why would it not stay on 5G? Is there any particular thing they could look for at that point that could be causing it to drop down to a lower level? Often this is about uh, signal strength or the presence of uh, 5G. Uh, uh, we talk about the, the coverage for, for a 5G cell, and yes, if you have line of sight, it, it can be a number of 100 meters. But in, in a city environment, what we see is more to maximum 300 meters coverage. So the cells are rather small, and the, the deployments we see today are more... You don't deploy 5G to have a complete coverage. Uh, you, you deploy hotspots to give extra capacity to the network. That will, of course, change going forwards, but that is what we have seen in, in many places. Uh, so often when we drop 5G, for example, it is about 5G coverage, the, the basic thing that you need. Okay, and I think we've got one more question. Is um, GSMR supported at all by InfoVista? Uh, the question, the answer to that is yes, but if I should answer it from my point of view, the answer is no. So from a measuring tool point of view, we do not support GSMR. But for example, in our planning tools, as far as I know, uh, you have the possibility to plan these kind of networks. But not Thames Investigation, not Thames Pocket not Temsense or Temps Paragon will support GSMR. Okay. Well, uh, I believe we've come to the end of our questions and pretty much the end of our time. So first of all, I'd like to thank Peter for that extremely interesting look at this subject and thank everyone here for attending. I trust that you found this session informative and useful. Any questions that have not been answered during this session, or if you have any further questions, please feel free to send them through. We will have an email address at the end and we can then get answers sent back to you. Please remember that all of the technologies and products that have been presented today can be rented through Electran or put onto one of our financial solutions. So if you have equipment needs going forwards, please feel free to contact our sales team to discuss the requirements. We can even facilitate calls between ourselves and InfoVista to make sure that we get you the best solution we can. It, again, if you have any further questions that were not covered today, please feel free to contact us and ask, and we'll work between ourselves and InvaVista to ensure that we get those answered for you. I hope that you have a good rest of your day and week, and thank you very much for attending.